Good morning and welcome. It's a great honor to be with you here today to mark one of the most important moments on our campus and in our world as we acknowledge the 400 years or four centuries of suffering by African slaves and their descendants in the English-based American colonies that helped form the present day United States of America. We come together today to reckon with this tragic past, but also to acknowledge the tremendous strengths and accomplishments of those who fought against slavery and continue to fight for justice today. Why is this important? This is a question that I've been asked many times over the course of planning this event and the ones that will follow it. Well-meaning people have asked, shouldn't we try to bury and forget about this part of our history and move forward and focus on our progress? One response to this question is taken from Faulkner's words when he stated, the past is never dead. It's not even past. A major theme threaded through the symposium today is that the legacies of slavery and the post-Reconstruction period are very much alive and continue to influence today's social, political, and economic outlook on race and need to be confronted. Another response, which reflects steps taken by the United Nations in recent years, is that in 2007, the UN declared that the 25th of March is the International Day of Remembrance of the, victory of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave, uh, and Transatlantic Slave, and will be observed annually. That is every year. In 2015, a permanent memorial was built to honor the victims of slavery and the slave trade as part of the UN's annual, annual acknowledgement of a day of remembrance. Um, called the Ark of Return, the memorial is a deliberate contrast to the door of no return in the House of Slaves in Senegal through which enslaved Africans were deported to the Americas. The Arc of Return is designed to reflect movement and openness, focusing on three elements. The first one is acknowledge the tragedy. The second is consider the legacy. And the third is lest we forget as part of the, pro the process of healing and transformation. An excerpt from the mission statement for the remembrance of slavery and the memorial at the UN states. The permanent memorial will serve as a reminder of the legacy of the slave trade. It will provide future generations an understanding of the history and consequences of slavery and serves as an educational tool to raise awareness about the current dangers of racism, prejudice, and the lingering consequences that continue to impact the descendants of the victims today. It is a reminder of the heroic actions of the slaves, abolitionists, and unsung heroes who acted in the face of grave danger and adversity. Today's symposium was planned in this spirit of remembrance and recognition as a gateway to transformation. Through this gathering, and we really appreciate you for being here, we are taking one of the first steps on a longer journey to support efforts for justice, belonging, and human rights. I want to point out that today marks just the beginning of this process. This event will be followed by many others throughout the entire academic year that you can be in touch with by visiting our website, 400yearsatberkeley.edu. We hope that the panelists, artists, and audience dialogues that we will experience today will help spark conversation, ideas, and action plans that deepen and grow over the following months. A major goal of today's event is to help make UC Berkeley, the state of California, our nation, and indeed the global environment more inclusive and just. In words taken from the motto of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, we want to make UC Berkeley a place for all people and a catalyst for change everywhere. Um, so I will stop now. Um, but 
before I go on, I would like to, to take this time for us to acknowledge that we are on the land of the indigenous Ohlone people and we will observe a moment of silence to respect that legacy. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Danielle Mark Wilson to the stage, who will lead us in the Black National Anthem. Good morning, are you all ready to sing? Yes. Great, I'm also the director of the Gospel Choir on campus, and I just want to say auditions are today. <laughs> So, in 1900, James Weldon Johnson penned the poem uh, that are the words to let Terry Voices sing. In 1905, check, check, check. his brother John Rosamond Johnson sent check, check, check. the Voices sing to music for a celebration of the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but it was a special year when the NAACP adopted it as the African American National Anthem. And that year it was in 1919 which means as we celebrate the 400 rec year recognition of that first batch of 20 slaves that were brought on Jamestown, Virginia, we're also celebrating the 100th anniversary of Lift Every Voice and Sing being adopted as the African American National Anthem. We had to learn this song by heart in church when I was a kid. And there's different traditions in singing it. Some people lift their fists. The one I like is having everyone join hands, cross your arms, right over left. Because music is more than entertainment and performance. <laughs> music is about community. <laughs> the first verse is a call to lift our voices. The second verse, recognize the history of our people. The third verse is a prayer. And during the prayer, we'll slow down the tempo. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty let our rejoicings rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us Sing a song full of the hope that the presence has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the day when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet stream through the place for which our people sighed. We have come over a way that with tears have been watered. We have come treading the path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out of the gloomy past Till now we stand at last Where the bright gleam of our bright star Is cast God of our weary years God of 
of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by thy might led us into the light, Keep us forever in thy path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget. Shadow beneath thy hand May we forever stand True to our God True to our native land And the people said, Ashe! Thank you so much, Brother Wilson, for that wonderful song. And now I'm delighted to, re to welcome our Chancellor Carol Chris to the stage, uh, without whom, without her leadership, um, we wouldn't all be here. Thank you. I, I, that was so enormously incredible. I want to first say how pleased I am to be, uh, to be able to welcome you to this day, and thank you, Denise. It's really an honor to be with you this morning. 400 years ago this month, a ship carrying between 20 and 30 enslaved Africans arrived at a coastal port in what was then the British colony of Virginia. The captives on board, likely from the kingdoms of Ndongo and Congo in southwestern Africa, were sold to the colonists and made to work in the region's newly established tobacco fields. The men, women, and children who came ashore in August 1619 were among the 12.5 million Africans who would be taken from their homes and brought in chains across the Atlantic Ocean over the course of two centuries. Their arrival marked the beginning of a cruel system of intergenerational forced servitude that inflicted backbreaking labor and a host of other atrocities upon black people in America. Their enslavement would shape the identity of a young nation, bring about its economic transformation into a world power, and alter the course of world history. It would also, in many ways, create the society and the continuing injustices that are with us today. 250 year, uh, years of slavery in America were followed by 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, and 35 years of racist housing policy, as well as the rampant discrimination that continues today. This symposium and the events that follow later this semester will reflect on this long and troubling history and the terrible harm that it continues to cause. But this year's commemorations also mark something else. They mark black Americans' courage in the face of incredible adversity. They mark resilience. They mark triumph. They mark the vast range of black Americans' contributions to society for the good of all people. We celebrate these extraordinary intellectual, social, and cultural contributions at both a national level and a local one as well. At Berkeley, we celebrate the more than two dozen black student organizations whose advocacy and activism are helping to improve black experience on our campus. We celebrate our black staff and faculty organization, which since 1979 has held our university accountable for ensuring that the experiences and contributions of black employees are recognized and honored. 
we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the African American Student Development Office, which advances the university's mission to support, develop, and grow black student leaders. We celebrate every staff and faculty member who's helping to ensure that the African American Initiative is effectively implemented and supported. We celebrate the African American Studies and African Diaspora Studies Department and each and every black faculty member who's generating and sharing knowledge in their fields of the highest level of scholarship. From 400 years ago through today, the journey of black Americans has been one of perseverance, strength, courage, and excellence. I want to thank Denise Hurd and the Haas Institute for spearheading this symposium and to thank all of the dozens of units from across the campus and beyond who are hosting events from the School of Public Health to CNR to Gender and Women's Studies and many others. Berkeley is a place where we both honor black achievement as well as have constructive conversations about turning from a path of injustice and discrimination to one of inclusion and justice. Both are so important, and I'm so glad that we're able to take them on today and throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor Christ. And now I'd like to um, welcome uh, our Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion, Oscar Dubon, to the stage. Good morning. Uh, my name is Oscar Dubon. My preferred pronouns are he, him, and I am truly delighted and honored to be here. On behalf of the vision of equity and inclusion, I'd like to thank the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, and specifically Denise Hurd, for really make, for making this, and the organizing committee, for making this incredible event happen. It's a real, it's, I know it's a labor of love, but also it's a labor of scholarship, it's a labor of effort, and it's a collective effort. So may I ask the organizing, organizers to please stand so that we can acknowledge them? Are they? Thank you so much. I am truly thrilled to be here because in so many ways this event helps us to understand where we are as a society and as a university and where we need to go. Relationships are complex. The relationship of this nation and this university with many peoples, with African Americans, is complex and we should never uh, stray away from that. As we strive to be a beacon of belonging, we must first recognize the brutal history of white supremacy and structural racism. That is our shared history in this nation. And it is at our legacy and the denial of the full humanity of black Americans in this country. This is something that is not just historical, it is also in the present. But I think this is really important because by acknowledging this history, we can heal. I really don't think we can heal without acknowledging where we are coming from. We can embrace more fully and appreciate more deeply the immeasurable gifts in art, in the economy, in scholarship. I personally, as an engineer, think about in science and in, in STEM fields of black Americans, not only to this nation, not only to this university, but to the entire world. Relationships are very complex, and I think a lot about that in terms of our relationship as an institution to our community here at the university. It is very difficult to heal uh, the relationship, the brutal relationship that has existed between policing and the black community without acknowledging that brutal history. We need to do that. We want to heal, but we first need to acknowledge that. It's hard to heal and move forward when we honor someone who is a pioneer at once, a pioneer of environmentalism and a slave owner, and where his name is on buildings and on awards. So how do we reconcile that? To me, that is importantly the work of ENI in supporting the campus in moving forward in these important issues so that we can all feel belonging. It is very difficult and to reconcile being excellent and not acknowledging 
the contributions of not only um, black scholars, but the scholarship that addresses directly the issues, the understanding of the black experience of black culture in this country. We cannot be excellent if we exclude that. And that's where we need to be forward. And that's where the university is trying to be, move forward. There are a lot of exciting initiatives that I, I'm really, uh, really thrilled about. I think the African American initiative is a, just a beginning of how we recognize the value of black Americans in, uh, on campus, but also make sure that it is not just a gift for the black community, but it's a gift for all the community when black Americans feel a belonging on this campus and when they thrive. And that's something that we are very committed to. We're also committed to diversifying leadership at the staff level, at the faculty level. And if we don't see more black Americans at, as leaders here, then we are failing. I know that the chancellor is committed to that, the provost is committed to that, and that we are, um, the, the division of ENI is completely committed to supporting you in that work and to doing a lot of that lifting. So I know I'm running short, so I just wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here with you, to be in community, and to really move forward this acknowledgement of our history so that we can heal for moving forward and be uh, a place of belonging for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor uh, Dubon. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Aya de Leon to the stage. Good morning. It's an honor to be here at this critical symposium the hashtag of which I understand is 400 years. Um, I was asked to uh, read some spoken word and I haven't written a lot of spoken word lately, mostly fiction. Um, but the first thing that came up was uh, how in 2005, I wrote a poem called Gulf Coast Middle Passage in response to Hurricane Katrina. And it seems that these disasters bring out the slavery paradigm in the way the US relates to African heritage bodies. More recently, I've been writing about how Hurricane Maria, a disaster brought about by climate change and US colonization, has revealed another face of white supremacy for the Puerto Rican people, another nation of slavery survivors. And as myself, an African American and Puerto Rican person, I write about both legacies because our struggles for freedom are all connected and are connected to the struggle for climate justice. This spoken word piece is part of my new book, Side Chick Nation, which was the first novel published about Hurricane Maria. And it's a spoken word piece that takes place in the novel called Puerto Rico and Mr. Jones. What you need to know is that the Jones Act of 1920 requires that all goods transported by water between U.S. ports, including Puerto Rico, must be carried on U.S. ships made in the U.S., owned and operated by U.S. citizens. And Puerto Rico's alleged debt to the U.S. is roughly equal to the accumulated revenue lost by Puerto Rico under the Jones Act me and Mr. Uh, Puerto Rico and Mr. Jones. <clears throat> me and Mr. Jones, we got a thing going on. America loves me, lets me wear his chain around my neck Heavy, heavy gold rope got me living larger than any of the other Caribbean islands. He tells me, ain't nobody ships but mine docking in that port, baby. He says, I belong to him. We both know that it's wrong, but it's much too strong to let it go now. He called a few years ago, mad as hell. I told him, I know I've racked up a lot of debt lately, but it's not like I don't want to work. I mean, if you would just let me, I know the ports belong to you, but if I could just, okay, okay, stop yelling. Yes, I know I owe you a lot of money. Yeah, okay, I'll cut back expenses, tighten the belt, austerity or whatever. We closed a lot of schools, cut the civil servants, but still I got this gold chain around my neck. I belong to him now more than ever. 
because he's got his own obligations and so so do I a little while back word got around the neighborhood that Irma was coming to kick my ass and he didn't show up to defend me but it was cool right I'm tough you know not one of those needy chicks but when Maria was heading my way <clears throat> talking about she was going to try to take me out for real. She was packing heat. I mean, that bitch was seriously dangerous, okay? I was like, Papi, you got me, right? You coming for me, right? And the winds came, and the waves crashed, and the houses got beat down, and the fallen trees blocked the road, and the water got in contaminated, and the gas supply dried up, and the food rotted, and the heat in the dead refrigerator, and the water flooded up to the roof. We up here vomiting, medicine spoiled, gangrene set in, viejitos rest homes turning to final resting places. And you didn't come for me, Bobby. You didn't fucking come for me. But you wasn't going to let nobody else help. I belonged to you. Me! Mr. Mr. Jones! Since 1900, didn't I send my children to cut your Hawaiian sugar cane? Since 1917, didn't I send my sons to die in your wars? Haven't I always let your corporate chains put my mom and pop stores out of business? Didn't I let you play your war games on my vieques for decades? Didn't I let you dump towers full of coal ash when your continental U.S. was too good to clean up its own mess, open ash dumps for the hurricane to knock down. Now your arsenic, mercury, chromium seeping into my people and Mr. Jones ain't got a goddamn thing going on to help. Your forefathers threw a hissy fit, dumped tea into Massachusetts Bay to protest King George. How the hell am I supposed to get 10 stories of coal ash up to Boston Harbor? How do I send this shame back, this third world side chick shame back where it belongs? No, Mr. Jones. You need to act like you got some respect. No, Mr. Jones, you need to act like you got some respect. No, Mr. Jones, you need to act like you got some respect. No, Jones. <laughs>